Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of From Birth Until Death. I'm your host Salim Hassani and in the previous episodes we've been going through starting at the beginning of the life of the newborn child and working our way through for many matters such as head shaving, circumcision, breastfeeding and we've now reached the other end of the spectrum. We're now inshallah going to be talking about the, when a person is on their deathbed. And with us once again, we're delighted to have Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you today, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair. Sheikh, just before we start uh, talking about the Janazah prayer, we just want to just complete one point about the custody which we, we touched upon and we're just about to complete in the last episode. We were talking about a, um, a female or, or a girl, whether they have a right to choose uh, who they want to, to be in custody of them. Yeah. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. We said that <coughs> uh, the children, in terms of custody, can be uh, classified as uh, children before the age of puberty yes. and the children above the age of puberty. Yes. The children before the age of puberty, uh, they should go with their mother, yes. as we explained before. Yes. And uh, the person who has the, ra who has the right uh, of custody over them is the mother, okay. generally speaking, as we uh, explained yes. whether those uh, children are girls or boys. Yes. Now, once the a child reaches the age of puberty, mm -hmm. the scholars say that uh, if the child is a boy, then the boy should be given the choice according to the hadith that we have mentioned that a man came with his wife uh, who divorced her and they have a dispute over their son. And the Prophet ﷺ took the son and he said to him, this is your mother, this is your father, go with whom you want. Yes. So uh, they took from this hadith that the baby boy or the boy should be given the choice okay. whether he wants to go with his mother or with his father. his father. Now if the boy uh, decided to go with his mother and then he changed his mind to go with his father, that's fine. Okay. And similarly, if he decided to go with his father and then he changed his mind and he wanted to go with his mother, that's fine. That is not a problem. Okay. Or he wanted to combine between both of them. Of course, uh, judgment should conclude the final setup because it, sometimes it might not be convenient for any of the parties. Okay. The father, the mother, and the a child. Yes. Or the son. Now, if the child is not uh, a male child in terms of daughters once they reach the age of puberty generally speaking mm -hmm. then they should go to their father all right okay okay now uh, some scholars said when she reaches the age of puberty some scholars said when she reaches the age of uh, being uh, yani, uh, able to m get married or ready for marriage mm -hmm. or some other scholars said when she reaches the age of nine Yes. Let us not get into these differences okay. <coughs> and let us leave, leave them to who, who? To judgment. Okay. To qada. Yes. And the qada judgment will decide which age. Okay. But generally speaking, if, she, uh, if the uh, child reaches the age of puberty, then she should go with her father okay. for a number of reasons. First of all, they said that uh, the father is the wali. Mm -hmm. And she cannot get married without the permission of the father. Okay. This is one thing. The other thing, it is very important, and I would like to address our sisters in particular, because I'm a member of the Islamic Sharia Council in the UK, and we always deal with these mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. And we see the problems of the community. And normally, um, the, a child or the young girl, she needs a man in her life. Mm -hmm. If she does not have a man in her life, then she will look for a man outside her family. Okay. And at that age, when 
our daughters go astray mm -hmm. and they start going for or looking for boys mm -hmm. outside and they might be involved in haram relationship. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there is no man to look after her. Yes. And that's why, subhanAllah, the Sharia knows that this is a need mm. for the girl. And uh, the Sharia confirmed that the girl should join her father. Now, once we say that the girl should join her father, it doesn't mean that she cannot go and visit her mother mm. or she cannot go and stay with her mother. Yes. No, of course she can go, she can visit. Sure. And here, uh, as we are concluding the issue of custody, yes. I would like to appeal to all of my brothers and sisters to fear Allah Jalla wa ala in their children. Mm. What I have seen, I know if I may go a little bit outside the fiqh discussion, mm. but what I have seen is that both parents once they are separated or divorced, they don't, they don't what? They don't remember that they were together at one time. They were sleeping together at one time. Allah Jalla wa says, وَلَا تَنْسَوُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ Don't forget the goodness that used to take place between both of you. Mm. And at the end of the day, this lady that I have divorced, she is my sister in al-Islam. Mm. At the end of the day, this man that has divorced me he is my brother in al-islam mm. this is how we should look at it yes and the key thing is this man or this wa this uh, woman yes they are what they are the parents of the children mm. so if i divorce my wife she is still the mother of my children yes if uh, my husband divorced me she he is still the father of my children so why don't our brothers and sisters, once they get uh, divorced, why don't they observe this? Mm. And the victim is who? Child. The children. And that's why we say, my dear respected brothers and sisters, fear Allah Jalla wa ala. It is a big problem. I have seen, Wallahi, Dr. Salim, I have seen some sisters accusing their ex-husbands of raping the children or having sexual relationship with the children in order to what in order to gain the custody of children before the civil court in the uk because you know in the uk it is not an islamic yeah. uh, law yeah. in terms of uh, personal law so they go to the civil court and the civil court decides and in order for the civil court to decide in their favor they accuse each other and in, in the Sharia Council, I have seen a brother, number of times in fact, brothers who are accusing their ex-wives of being what? Prostitutes or used to be prostitutes or sleeping with other men. And I say, subhanAllah, fear Allah. This lady that you are accusing of being a prostitute or sleeping with other men, at the end of the day, she is the mother mm -hmm. of your children. So you are shaming your children yes. by calling her a prostitute or accusing her of sleeping with men. Yes. So it, it is a big subject. Maybe uh, I'm sure this channel and other channels, they really need to deal with this yes. issue. Yes, I mean, okay. that's a very important issue and a, a very important point you made, especially the fearing of Allah. Uh, and that brings us nicely onto the, to the next topic, the, the janazah at the funeral. Because as we know, we will all die at one point in time. So when we are on our deathbed, for example, when one of us is about to die, when someone we know, a family member, a friend, a relative, what should they be doing? Okay. Now we are moving from the uh, previous subject to the subject of uh, janazah yes. and death. Yes. And I would like to remind uh, the viewers that we are not discussing it from a mawa'idha perspective mm. or from... A reminder perspective. Yes. Now we are discussing it from a legal perspective. Yes. Sometimes we mention some social aspects as well as uh, admonition or reminders aspects in, in, in uh, the discussion. First of all, the person, my dear respected brothers and sisters, should be ready for death because death may come at any point. Mm. It's true that some people might be on the deathbed. They know that they are on the deathbed. But other than that, we don't know 
Yes. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Kullu nafsin da'iqat al-maut. Each soul will taste death one time. Yes. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confirmed that the person does not know when he is going to die. Mm. And Allah Jalla wa Ala mentioned this in the Quran as well. That the mafatih of the ghayb belongs to Allah Jalla wa Ala. Allah knows the unseen. Mm -hmm. And uh, among the unseen is when the person or where the person is going to die. Yes. And there are, of course, a number of statements regarding uh, this. So the person should be ready for that moment. And the person, the wise person, should not say, Oh, I am healthy and I don't think that I will die now. Or the person uh, should just not avoid thinking about death. Mm. And you know that the Prophet Sallallahu said what? أَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَذِ مِنْ Remember a lot, frequently. Mm. What? The destroyer of all desires. Mm. And Allah Jalla wa challenged all people. قُلْ فَدْرَأُوا عَنْ أَنفُسِكُمُ الْمَوْتِ Deter death. Mm. Allah Jalla wa challenged them. Can you deter death? Mm. So the person should be ready all of the time. Yes. And uh, I remember last year in the UK, or some time ago, very recent in the UK, uh, it was mentioned in the news that the story of that brother who was a very talented brother studying medicine and he was going to his school on his bike and he did not go back to his family. And the, it, the, the, his friends were shocked to hear that he went through a truck and he died on the spot. And they said, oh, that was not fair. He, has a, uh, he is a talented person and so on. And there are thousands of stories mm. like this. Mm. The point is, subhanallah, what is not fair? Mm. The ajal and the lifespan belongs to who? All of us the, the know that it belongs to Allah Jalla wa'ala. Allah Jalla wa'ala knows that. Allah Jalla wa'ala gave me a certain period of time, gave you a certain period of time and so on. Yes. I don't know that. I don't, you don't know this. And no one has control over it. So this is generally speaking, we have to be ready for that moment yes. at any point of time, not necessarily on the deathbed. Of course, there are some uh, particular rulings regarding deathbed. We will talk about them. Okay. Um, can I add something or we yes, have to go I to the break? I mean, I'm just being break. told we're going to go to a break, Sheikh. Jazakallah okay. uh, khair for this. When we come back from the break, the Sheikh will continue and we'll talk more about the deathbed. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Come on, my brothers, let us pray. This time is now. Do not Al Imam al Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him, have indeed uh, did a great and a tremendous job in compiling some of the most beautiful ahadith and relevant ayat in one of his marvelous works, which is known as Riyadh al Salihin or Gardens of the Pious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all amongst the dwellers of gardens of the pious. Jannat al Naeem. Allahumma ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back after the break. Before the break, we were talking about death and being prepared for death. And we're delighted to have us want to have with us Sheikh Hitam al Haddad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Sheikh, before we went to the break, we were talking a bit about being prepared for death and how it affects all of us. And um, you, were, you were telling us a story. And we'd just like you to continue 
yeah. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Um, when I was uh, in the university in Dhuhran KFUPM, uh, a friend of mine uh, told me that uh, one of his relatives uh, is about to die. Mm -hmm. So his family called him and they told him if you bring a religious person with you. Mm. So anyway, he took me and we went. And the person was about to die. Mm. And he had cancer. Mm. And subhanAllah, he was, I remember him until now. You can say that skin over bones only, mm. over skeleton. Mm. And, uh, but he was awake and he was uh, conscious and he can speak. So we started to speak to him, how are you, etc. Yes, I am tired, I am fine. And then his wife said that he is refusing to say La ilaha illallah. Oh, okay. He's a Muslim. Mm. That was in Saudi Arabia. Mm. And uh, he was refusing to say La ilaha illallah. So she said, as he started to speak to you, can you remind him to say La ilaha illallah? So we started and we said, okay, Abu Flan, can you say La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah? Wallahi, he refused. And he is insisted not to say it. And then we were sh surprised, shocked. Mm. Then after some time, uh, a relative of his came from Jordan. And he said, oh, Abu Fulan, Abu Muhammad, do, do you remember me? He said, yeah, 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 Abu Fulan, where you are, uh, are you living here in Saudi Arabia? He said, no, I live in Jordan, but I came all the way mm. to visit you. He said, okay, thank you very much, etc. And then the visitor started to persuade this person who is who was on the deathbed, to say, La ilaha illallah. So he said, Abu Muhammad, say, La ilaha illallah. Then after some time, he managed to say, La ilaha illallah. Hmm. And then he said, Abu Muhammad, Muhammad Rasulullah, say, Muhammad Rasulullah. Wallahi, Dr. Salim. He started to shout. And he said, this is too much. Don't ask me for too much. Go away, all of you, keep away from me. Hmm. Subhanallah, he spoke about everything except what? La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. What does that mean? In the Quran, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Yuthabbitu Allahu alladheena amanu bil qawli thabiti fil hayati dunya wa fil akhira. Allah make firm those who believe in him in the dunya and in the akhira. Allah make them firm in hmm. the dunya. The scholar said, how Allah Jalla wa Ala makes them firm in the dunya? By saying la ilaha illallah when they are about to die. Because the person who is away from Allah Jalla wa ala, yes. he will not remember Allah Jalla wa ala at the time of the death. Yes. Because Allah is not in his conscience. Mm. Allah is not there. Allah is not present in his heart, in his tongue, in his mind. Yes. So how can this person will remember Allah at that point? Mm. And there are Subhanallah, hundreds of stories like this. We can spend the whole episode and other episodes. Yes. And I'm sure uh, the, uh, our brothers and sisters know of so many stories like this. Yes. The point is, my dear respected brothers and sisters, don't delay tawbah. Mm -hmm. And this is the first important uh, lesson or the first important action a person about to die or the people around that person who is about to die should encourage him to do is to repent to Allah Jalla wa we should repent to Allah Jalla wa all of the time wa tubu ila Allah jami'an ayyuhal mu'minun la'allakum tuflihu tubu the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said i am a person who repent to Allah Jalla wa ala every day 100 times so tawbah to repent to Allah Jalla wa yes. they also said that I'm just going through these things quickly. Mm. Uh, they also said that part of the tawbah to remember if, they, uh, if there are rights over you, if there are people who, uh, whom you owe some rights. Okay. So you must give them their rights or tell the relatives around you about these rights. Okay. For example, if I have taken money from a person and no one knows about it, or I was planning to give it to him, to give it back to him, but I could not give it back to him, we should, I should, uh, on my deathbed, write to people, 
please give this amount of money for this person. Okay. He owes me this amount of money, and so on. Yes. And here, this brings us to the issue of wasiyah. Mm -hmm. And in particular, in non-Muslim countries, wasiyah is very, very important. And we can say that wasiyah, to write a will, mm -hmm. might be considered as wajib. Right. Obligatory upon us. Obligatory upon us. Why? Because in the West, first of all, uh, the law is not an Islamic law. Yes. So the inheritance or the assets will not be distributed according to the Islamic law unless we write in our will that I am interested in having my assets distributed according to the Islamic law. Right. And we all of know hadith, Abdullah ibn Umar, when he said that the Prophet wasallam said that it is not befitting for a Muslim person to stay three nights or two nights except with his will written in front of, uh, next to him. Mm. And as a result of this, Abdullah ibn Umar, he never stayed two days except with his will written and put next to him. Okay. Okay? So, this is the first important thing. Write a will. In the will, what are you going to write? As we said, if the country is not an Islamic country, and your assets are unlikely to be distributed according to Islam, yes. then you must take certain measures in order for the will, for the assets to be distributed according to Islam. Okay. I think we will have, um, in the, the, after a few episodes, we will be discussing the inheritance law. Yes, inshallah, we're going to be mentioning this. And this is part of it. Yes. That make sure, my dear respected brothers and sisters, you take enough measures so your uh, assets will be distributed according to Islam. Yes. So this is the first thing. The second important thing, if you owe someone or someone owes you money or some people owe you any money property, whether for you or against you, you must write that in the will. Okay. If no one knows about it. Why? Because if it is your right, if you die, then it will become the right of your children. Yes. Is it clear? It will be passed on to the right of your children. Exactly. So if I have, for example, given um, 100,000 uh, pounds as a loan for someone, and no one knows about it, so this 100,000 pounds, when I die, they become what the right of my uh, children or my legal heirs, not yes. necessarily my children. Okay. So if I don't write this, and the person, he did not pay it back or he denied it, then I have deprived my children from what? From their right. Yes. So, and this is not allowed, and that's why I have to include it in my will. Okay. If I have borrowed money, if I have taken 100,000 pounds, and it is in my bank account, yes. let us say, and I died, and that money, if it is in my bank account, it will go to my legal heirs. And the people who own that money might struggle in getting it back. Mm -hmm. and so in order to preserve their rights, I have to include it in my will. Okay. You know that in Hadith Jabir, uh, anhu, the Prophet وسلم, was about to pray on a janazah. And he said, is there any debt mm. payable on behalf of this janazah? Yes. So they said, yes. In one riwayah, the Prophet ﷺ said, in one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, how much? They said, two dirham. Mm -hmm. Then the Prophet ﷺ stopped praying on that janazah. And there are a number of narrations where the Prophet ﷺ used to ask, is there any debt on this deceased? Yes. So... From this, we should be careful of debts. Mm. And until Abu Qatada came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I will look after the debt. Then the Prophet ﷺ what? Prayed. Okay. So we should not leave the right of people uh, without making sure that our legal heirs will give them their rights. Okay. 
All right. So this is the second uh, thing that we should have prepared. You mentioned tawbah and repentance. Repentance and writing a will. Writing a will. Writing a will should be done just at, a, a, at any time. In fact, every let me appeal to all my brothers and sisters that they should go now and write their wills. Mm. Also, part of the will that should be written, especially in non-Muslim countries, and maybe most of our, our viewers live in non-Muslim countries, is how the janazah will be processed. Yes. Is it going to be processed according to Sharia, or is it going to be pro processed according to the law of the land? Yes. Now, if there is nothing in the will, it might be processed according to the law of the land which in most cases un-Islamic. Yes. And they might do cremation. Mm, cremation, yes. Cremation. Yes. For the body. Yes. And I came across a few instances where the person was processed, the deceased yes. was processed like right. this. Jazakallah khair for this information, Sheikh. We're coming to an episode, another end of a, another episode of From Birth Until Death. Please join us in the next episode where we'll be discussing further the janazah, the funeral prayer and what we should do uh, when this happens. Jazakum Allah khair wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. From those around, I hear a cry, a muffled sob, a hopeless sigh. I hear their footsteps leaving slow, and then I know my soul must fly. At last it comes to heaven or hell, the sign which now do not delay. Leaving slow